The Apostle Paul was this sufficient example. In 2 Corinthians 12, it says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now here's what happened. The Apostle Paul had some really cool insight, by the way. He had some really unique perspectives, some really unique revelation from God. He dominates the New Testament. He writes and writes and writes. But he had a past too, by the way. He had a real rough past where he thought what was doing God's will was killing Christians. He was confused. He came to know Christ as his Savior. And God gives him, gives him this an abundance of revelation. So what happens is he allows Satan to give him a thorn in the flesh. Now, there's been a lot of talk on what that thorn was. They say, well, now the, you know, the thorn was this, the thorn was that. Well, forget it. I don't, it doesn't matter. The, he had an infirmity of some sort. And it was a significant infirmity. And it was significant enough that it was to keep him humble. That he would not boast in the abundance of revelation that God had given him. So God kept him humble because that's who God uses. He uses the humble. In James chapter 4, it says, but he giveth more grace. Now, I, now explain that to me. How the, how, how the God of the universe, who is the God of all grace, the creator, sustainer, the source and the supplier of all grace is able to say, but I'm going to give you more. <laughs> I don't even get that. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resists the proud, but he giveth grace unto the humble. God uses the humble people. He can't use the proud people, right? So he takes the way. Well, actually, he can. He can use anybody that he wants, anytime, because he's God. And how God uses the wicked things to perform his righteous purpose, I don't know. But God can do anything. But God, God's intent was to use this man, Paul, and to use his sufferings. And he did suffer. And he had infirmities. And he had these things that happened to him. So we learned from him. In, uh, in 2 Corinthians 11. It says. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths oft. Now listen to this. Listen to this. Uh, litany of things that happened to Paul. Because we have to understand grace from his perspective. And I think you'll understand it better in just a second. He says, of the Jews, five times receive I 40 stripes, save one. Five times 40 stripes. Five times 40? That's a lot of whipping. Listen to this. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three other times he says he suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I, uh, have I been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen. Is there anything worse than being in perils of your own countrymen? These are the people who are supposed to be for you. In perils, uh, in perils by the heathen. Well, these are the people that are against you. In perils in the city. This is where the people were. And in perils of the wilderness. This is where the people weren't. This guy suffered and was in tremendous peril all the time in perils in the sea and perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness. This is a guy, the Apostle Paul was a guy that wasn't just tired, he was, he was hurt. All of these things happened to the Apostle Paul. This isn't a, 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 an exaggeration of truth. This is a guy that we would classify as a guy who went through the ringer. He was in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and in nakedness. Verse 28 is, is probably my favorite. Besides those things that are without, besides all of those things that affect me externally, affect me in the body, all of the stuff, all of that, all of the problem and that affliction outside he says, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Not only are there things outside, but there's things on the inside. Paul, you, God, God used Paul, God used Paul, a person who has been through the proverbial ringer, who could have easily thrown up his hands and said, Lord, your grace is insufficient. 
I, I doubt your integrity and I doubt your supply. I don't care if you created the heavens and the earth or not, but you can't possibly give me more grace. But that's not what Paul said. And you know, that's the best part of this whole passage. It's not what Paul said. Just in the next chapter, listen to what he says. And he said unto me, this is in the next chapter, after just going through this litany of abuse that this guy went through. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for you. What I have, I am the God of all grace. I didn't just create the world. I sustain the world. I own the world. I redeem the world. I keep the world safe. I am God and I, my sufficient grace is sufficient for you, Paul. This isn't a guy who doesn't speak from experience. This is a guy who spoke from his heart. This is a guy who spoke from his heart. I think oftentimes we think our problems are unimaginable. We think that we need more grace than the next guy. We think that God's grace might be insufficient for me and him. I think oftentimes that the average Christian thinks they have above average problems. I, I met with a guy, sometimes I do I help financial counseling for people, and I met with this young family. This was uh, years ago. I met with this young family, and we began to talk, and, and uh, they said, we are, we, are, we are in debt up to our eyeballs. He says, we will never, quote unquote, get out of this. We are so bad. We, 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 have, we, we have spent so much money. We don't, we, we just, we're so broke. I mean, he couldn't hardly collect his thoughts. That's how broke he was. And in my mind, I'm thinking, man, this, this is a challenge. <laughs> I'm going to help this guy. This is going to be good. And I, I said, okay, well, I said, bring in all your books. I said, I want your bank statements. I want your credit cards. I want your receipts. I said, I want to help you through this. And I said, we'll see what we can do. And he was, he was so perplexed. He sat down with me. We talked for about five minutes. And I said, bottom line, what's, how bad is it? Pastor, you're not going to like this. It's $10,000. I said, are you kidding me? I think I actually said that. I said, well, this is no problem. And he says, no, no, this is bad. This is really bad. He says, I owe this much on a credit card. I owe this much on my car. And I owe this much and blah, blah, blah. And these three, four credit cards. And I, I'm like, I think I said this exact words. I'm like, dude, you got like $10,000 in debt. I said, this is not a problem. This, this, is, this is easy. I was hoping it was like a million, you know? <laughs> because then I can say I could, I helped this guy out of a million dollars in debt. And you see, what his problem was is he thought that as being an average Christian, he had above average problems, which needed a significant amount more grace than what God has already given him. And I reassured him. I said, listen, I said, this is not a problem. I said, this, this, is, a, this is an easy one. I said, I promise you, this is an easy one. This is an easy one. And he says, well, just show me what to do. And I said, well, if you're going to be that teachable, this is what I would do. In three weeks... We had this thing taken care of. I mean, three weeks. I mean, it was nothing. I said, you got a tax return coming. How much are you getting? He says, about 6,500. I'm like, give me something harder. Next. I said, this is easy. See, see our, our problems, the, what we have, the things that we go through, and I don't want to minimize. Listen, I'm telling you, I don't want to minimize them. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I'm not saying that we don't walk around and we're not, we're not in despair sometimes because we are. But listen, listen. Our problems are not as, they're just not as bad as what we make them out to be. And now we're going to talk about what Paul said about that just real quickly. He said this, and I think that you ought to note it because it's so true. We, we, we take our little problems and we magnify them. And this is what Paul said. He says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment. In the grand scope of things, we have no problems. How many of you woke up on Monday morning, heard the news and said, thank God that wasn't our church. 
You think we have problems? I wonder at the next big problem, I wonder how many of those people in that church after 9-11 happened and the World Trade Centers were taken down, they said, thank God that wasn't us. I wonder how many of those people remember the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima and said, well, thank God that wasn't us. See, our problems, what we deal with is so light and it's but for a moment. He didn't say we have a big problems that last for a short period of time or we have these little problems that last for a long time. He says we have these little itty bitty problems that last a little bitty time. And what's happening is they're working a far more exceeding eternal weight and glory. There's something happening there that I don't understand it. But what I do understand is this. A guy who was beaten and shipwrecked and stoned to death and he was, and he was, he was forsaken by everybody and everything he knew. He was hated by his loved ones. He was hated by the people who hated him. I mean, this guy, he went through a lot and he says, my grace is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient for me. These are little afflictions for a short period of time. Now, even our light afflictions, even in our light afflictions, we need to get our strength from God because he's the source. I wouldn't ask someone else for grace when I know that the God of all grace has an unlimited source an unlimited supply of grace. I, I, I would go to him because we know that he is sufficient. We need to get our strength from God. Let me show you two more verses with you here. And, and, and I want, I want to, this is really crucial to understanding this grace and getting this strength from God. In John 15, 5, it says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. It's a great illustration for those of you who, are, uh, who, who, who have, uh, well, who have gardens. <laughs> He says, I am the vine. Jesus is, is the main, main trunk. He says, you are the branches. You're the offshoots. You're the limbs that come off of the main, the main stem, the main trunk. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you abide in him and he abides in you, it says, look at this. The same bringeth forth much fruit. The same brings forth much fruit. But without me, he says, you can do nothing. The people who are wondering, who are, who, who, who are always questioning the, the, the supply of grace that God gives and who are always in, 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 in this sort of peril mentally and say, man, I, I, just, I just am really struggling. Are you abiding in Christ? Because without him, you can't do anything. It's amazing how many times the world says, well, you don't need Christ. And I say, well, that's all I need. Because look at the next verse in Philippians 4.13. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So without Christ, you can't do anything. But with him, you can do everything. Now that's cool. I love the fact that I go to the person who has unlimited supply of grace. He is the maker of grace. And he gives more grace even than when we had before, even though it was limitless. And I don't understand that. God's grace is so sufficient. And we never need to be worried about how are we going to get through this or that. We just say, Lord, I need more grace. And do you think a good heavenly father is going to hold back something like grace to his children when he has already given us his son? Of course not. Why would he? He's already given us his son, Romans 8. You saw that. Friends, if you're new here today and you do not know Christ as your Savior, if you have never trusted in Him as your Savior, I want to show you this illustration. I want this hand to represent you and me and I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says that we here have this sin. Every single person has sin. The Bible says that God loves us but hates our sin. The Bible says that the wages of this sin, the payment for the sin is, is death. That is spiritual separation from God for all eternity. That's what that death is. The wages of the payment for the sin is death. Now, there's a lot of churches that say this. They say, well, if you turn over a new leaf, they use the word repent. They say, repent and turn over a new leaf. They say, head a different direction with your sin. They say, get water baptized. They say, walk an aisle. They say, pray a prayer. They say, all of these things. 
And let me tell you, friends, those are all fine things, but it doesn't save you because the wages of sin is death. Someone had to die to make a payment for your sin. So either you can do it and spend an eternity separated from God, or you can trust that Jesus Christ, and I want this hand, I mean it reverently to represent the Lord Jesus, that he, he Christ, was made sin for us. Now, he knew no sin. That's what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 5.21. He knew no sin. That means he could pay for your sin because he didn't have a debt of his own to pay. Because he didn't have a debt of his own to pay, he's able to pay all of our debt. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this cross to die on the, to die on the cross to make a payment for our sin. He was buried and then he rose again the third day and, he, and that proves to, to God the Father that his payment was sufficient. See, if he didn't raise from the dead, if he wasn't raised from the dead and he, was, and he was still dead in a grave somewhere, then he's not God because God is eternal, right? So God has to live. He has to live. But he still had to die because the only payment that was sufficient was a perfect payment. And I ask people, I say, well, do you know where you're going when you die? And they say, I'm a pretty good person. I say, well, being good is good, but being good isn't good enough to get you to heaven. I say, you've got to be perfect. And the only person who is perfect that can purchase your salvation is Jesus when he died on the cross to make the payment for your sin. And then he looks at you and me as righteous as him. His grace saved us. His grace secured us. The Bible says that we are kept by the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. We're kept by his power, by his strength. We're sanctified by his grace. By God's grace, we grow. We actually grow in grace because, his, because he gives us grace. And his grace is sufficient. There's not, there's not something more that I'm more passionate about than God's grace, his unfailing grace. Listen, we're not a perfect church. We're not a big church. But let me tell you what. One thing that this church will stand on and will always stand on is that we are saved by God's grace. And I'm not talking to some of these other churches that say, yeah, but you've got to live a good life or you've got to feel bad for your sin in order to be saved. Friends, you and I know that you don't feel bad for your sin until you are saved. And even then, sometimes you don't feel bad for your sin. We stand with grace. His grace is sufficient. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through your faith. Without that, we're not going to heaven. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. Praise God it's not of myself because I couldn't earn my salvation. My wife knows that. I can't do anything right. <laughs> Actually, I had a guy in the lobby last week. Was it last week? And he said, so what did we say? Something about, um, he says, something's wrong. It's always the man's fault. I said, It is? You know, I said, this is not a good advocate. You know? <laughs> and he says, either it's something they did or it's something they didn't do. <laughs> I'm just kidding. My wife thinks I'm perfect. That's why she married me. So we have perfect offspring. Definitely. <laughs> Friends, none of us are perfect. I thank God that Jesus was perfect and that he died for us. And if you haven't done that, I just ask you, would you trust Christ as your Savior today? Would you receive him as your Savior? 